through all the problems, through all the heartaches. Boxing and kickboxing and karate and wrestling are very similar to life. Life is a fight. We're always in a battle. You're fighting to survive. This life is no tiptoe to the rosies. Once you get knocked down by life, you got to get back up man, and just keep moving forward. God's already set us up and he's already helped us to overcome these battles. I gotta keep pressing forward and not looking back at my past. Without faith, you're not gonna make it. This is the most important decision that you can ever make in your life. That is a strength that will carry you from now to eternity. As long as you get up and you don't quit, you'll never be knocked out. That's how you become a knockout artist. Well, he's got Kerry Farr in his corner. Kerry Farr knows the boxing game. Hello, friends. I'm Kerry Farr with In Your Corner Productions. Some of you may know me as a television host, but I spent over 25 years of my life working in the corner of the boxing ring with amateur and professional boxers. Over the next several minutes, we're gonna go into the background of some of the boxers and kickboxers that I've known through the years and see how they have overcome obstacles in their life. Yes! And I wanna tell you, I've had such an honor and respect for you for so many years. I've watched you in the amateurs, watched you as a pro, and you know, your career has just amazed me. And I, I told you off camera last night that I'd sat down across from Jack Dempsey. I was only in my 20s, he was in his 70s. Then I sat down and talked with Muhammad Ali. And last night we broke bread together. I sat down with you. And folks, honestly, this man right here could on any given night beat anybody from all, Jack Dempsey was champion back in the 20s, all the way up to today. Evander, I think you were so good that you, on any given night you could beat anybody in the history of boxing. Well, thank you. That's all you got to say about well, that? I mean, I tell you all of that and that's all you... Well, I'm done. You know, I never get an opportunity to do it though, but it is, it's a good saying and it's people opinion. People, when people make their opinion, this is how they feel about it. And I kind of feel that I would be that and I'm happy that you're saying it and I don't have to say it. Yeah. Well, you know, Evander, I read your book. I've heard stories about you all of your life. You know, your mother had a tremendous impact on you. And there's a story that I heard about you and a fighter by the name of Cecil Collins. And you were actually going to quit when you were a kid, but your mother wouldn't let you quit. Tell us that story. Well, well what, what happened uh, in family, you know, people, you know, uh, you know my, my older brother, he told me that, you know, white boys can fight. So now they may be smart, but they can't fight. And so, you know, I learned at an early age, he was wrong. Because <laughs> Cecil Collins beat me. And when he beat me, I started crying. And, um, and my, mama, my mama said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I quit. She said, no, I didn't raise a quitter. You got to go back. And I fought him again. And he beat me again. And I started crying. And still mad to go back. And I, you know, so when I turned 13, I was hoping that I wasn't going to fight him. Because I, I brought a five pound weight, so whatever Cesar so Collins weighed, <laughs> I wasn't going to weigh it. And so since I didn't see Cesar since I didn't see him, you kind of, you know, okay, he ain't here. And uh, I put the five pound up and I made it to the final. Travel with Keith, and uh, we went to some marvelous places. He and I would probably still admit was the best trip we ever had was when we went with Cannibal Atkin, and uh, we were talking about uh, Harold Smith, right? Yep. Was it, 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 that had promoted that fight with Tommy Hearns, and we took we went to Hawaii. Went to Hawaii, and uh, and awesome. so uh, Harold, you know, I got to know him. He was from Alabama originally. He said, "Kerry, when you come out here, bring me a country ham." And so I took him a country ham, and he rented a van. We got to Hawaii. 
and we would run off with the van, and he'd yeah. say, Kerry, I need to take Hearns. <laughs> so I would go drive Tommy Hearns and Milton McCrory and all those guys yeah. to the gym, and that was just, you know, I mean, we had a free trip. Yeah, it was we awesome. Had, <laughs> we had a free trip to I was Hawaii. 18, I think. Yeah. I was, I was 17, 18. Well, you were Ken. And got paid to yeah, go you were, to Hawaii. You were Ken's sparring partner because <laughs> I mean, you were great. the closest we could get to right. imitating Tommy Hearns. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ken did well for himself in that fight. Yeah, he was. He, he did was, really good. He, he got cut in the third round, but up, but, up that time. Yeah. You know, got to meet, like you say, Milton McCrory, Tommy Hearns. All unreal. those guys. Tommy Hearns actually from Tennessee, where he's born. He born in Memphis, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. He's known as the fighting policeman, Ken the Bull Atkins. Four years ago this very day, something very tragic happened in your life. Your sister was murdered and that had to be the hardest blow that you ever received in your life. Um, I was the last person that ever talked to my sister, Missy. Uh, she was at Walmart Christmas shopping for other people's kids that didn't have the, the means to get them presents. And she was, she was just so excited. Uh, and, you know, she, not only was she my, my sister, she was probably my best friend. And so it was a spat with her child's father and uh, snuck in in the middle of the night and murdered your sister. Yeah, she, uh, from what I understand, of course, she was home and uh, he was uh, hiding back behind the house in a, in a wooded area until she got home and then snuck in behind her and uh, he shot her in the back of the head four times. I remember you called me the morning after that had happened and obviously you were devastated. You, you know, as tough as you are, you know, I mean, that, that is devastating to anybody. And you called me and you were crying and you said, you know, Missy's been shot. I first started working with Adam Richards when he was eight years of age. Over the next six or seven years, he had won four national championships and a junior world championship. In fact, him and Mike Tyson are the only two amateurs to ever win the Junior Olympics two years in a row, all the way from regional through the national tournament and knock out every single person they met. Adam Richards is someone to keep an eye on. I mean, when you were 15 or 16 years of age, I, I remember, I won't mention any names, but I remember a, uh, a grown man that, uh, you know, was a lot older than you, probably close to 30, that you actually knocked out in the gym. Yep, I remember that. I remember the left hook I hit him with. I think you yep. hit him with the left hook, yep. right hand. Yep. And uh, I remember it too, and he decided he didn't want to spar with you anymore. Right, right. <laughs> I remember he was, he was always the progressor, progressor, but I hit that time in my life where my power really developed and, and it developed really quick, so. Yeah, I mean, because up until the time you were you know, maybe 14 years of age, you had fought and you weren't knocking anybody mm -hmm. out. Then no. all of a sudden, when you hit 15, you just started knocking yep. everybody out. Yeah, for two and a half years, I knocked everybody out of fall. All of those belts you see there don't belong to me. They belong to the legendary Troy Dorsey, who won five world championships in kickboxing, one in karate, and two in professional boxing. Troy, such an honor to see you. Thank you for joining me on In Your Corner. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you uh, inviting me, allowing me to give a little bit of my testimony and talk about a little bit about my career. So many life lessons, you know, you try hard, uh, you train hard, you uh, do your best, and then does that always lead to success? It doesn't, but that's what that, you know, those are parallels with, with, with uh, life. Uh, try hard and do your best and keep your head up and uh, don't give up. So, because uh, if you do that, it's not, you're not always gonna win, but you know, when you look back, you can say, okay, I did my best, and then you just keep looking forward. The Bible says, uh, press forward to the mark, look forward, don't look back like what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back. So we have to keep pressing forward and keep looking forward, no matter what happens, whether we get beat, whether we lose, whether they get knocked down, and sometimes you get kicked while you're down too. If somebody wants to become a champion, I read somewhere recently that if you want to be great at something, you need to put 10,000, you need to devote 10,000 hours yeah. into it. Yeah, that's You've true. got 10,000 hours in this discipline, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Being great is a lot of little things done very well and often. 
Yeah, and so you teach those things still today? Yes, I mentor a lot of the guys around here in this area. You know, a lot of the kids come here, a lot of them come from broken homes and stuff like that. It's my way of giving back, you know what I mean? It is. Uh, I, I want to help these guys become uh, more than just the number one drug dealer or something like that along those lines, you know what I mean? So I want them to, to channel their energy into something positive. So is that how you would you would take a young man that's struggling with stuff like that? Oh, yeah. I got a few of them in here. And, and, and what would you do? Well, yeah, number one is yeah, I want to talk to them and make sure where they are uh, physically and then check on their home life. And if they're going to school, I want them to bring them their report card. I take, take some off their tuition. And some guys can't afford their tuition, so I have them to clean up the gym, load things like that. And I mentor these guys. Some guys, you know, hey, you bring me two A's in your report card, we'll go play top golf. So, you know, a lot of guys that don't have that opportunity. So you use it as a ministry, as a way to minister to kids? Yes, sir. My dad loved Carmen Basilio. And I said, one of my thrills in boxing was meeting Carmen Basilio. Right. And, and uh, you know, he's, I told him, I said, my dad, you, you know, if you fought, we watched, we listened, if we could. I said, you were his favorite fighter. And uh, he says, he's still alive. And I said, yes. He said, well, get him on the phone. So I called my dad up and Carmen said, uh, he wanted to know what his name was. And I told him, he says, is this Gene Hale? My dad says, yes. He said, this is Carmen Basilio. And I hear you want to whoop my... <laughs> <laughs> but that was a thrill to, to be about some of those old fighters. Benito Baby Ortiz was trained by the famous boxing trainer, Jimmy Glenn managed by Gil Clancy, who also managed three-time world champion Emil Griffith. Benito was a rising star. And you fought in Madison Square Garden with Muhammad Ali. He was called Cassius Clay then. That's my fifth fight. Yeah, that, was your, that was your pro debut, yeah, and he was fighting Doug Jones that night, who was right. a very tough fight for him. Yes. And you were in a fight with a guy that was bigger than you, you were beating the guy easy, but he got you got caught late in the fight and got knocked out. Well, the problem is uh, I weighed 120, 29 pounds, and, and the guy weighed 135, you know, and and he called me, he called me one punch. You know, you don't hit me too many punch, only one punch right in the neck, and he knocked me down. He caught you right where an artery is. And right in the neck. And I knocked me, knocked me out for 24 hours. Knocked you out for 24 hours. Yeah. Then you got up, and sadly, your manager, I mean, your trainer, Jimmy Glenn, flew home and left you in San Juan all by yourself. Yes, that's a hug. I stayed home, I stayed in the hospital by myself. You stayed in the hospital by yeah. yourself? Yeah, when I wake up in the hospital, so nobody with me there. I mean, and, and I feel like, uh, man, he let me here, like, like die, you know what I mean? It's, well, thank God, um, I get up. I, I get up out of the time, and I get up from San Juan to New York, so in the Bronx. I live in Home Street in the Bronx. My wife, uh, Sonia, she have it about two or three months, two months pregnant. And when I, when I take a taxi in the airport to go into my house, I knock the door because I left my wife with my, with my mother. And then when he opened the door, I went down and I get off three more later in the hospital. Gene Hatcher has become the new WBA junior welterweight champion of the world. Gene, it's so good to see you. And uh, you know, there was a time in your life, here you'd been the champion of the whole world, a boxing champion, you'd been on national television, you had all of this notoriety, you had this fame, you had money, you had everything. But there came a time in your life after your boxing career where you were so low that you actually put a gun to your head and contemplated suicide. Kerry, um, the boxing business that I got to be part of and, and accomplish some things, it, uh, I found, was a good thing. At that time of my life, it was the greatest thing that I could know. And when all of those things started to disappear, and I felt within my heart that I had lost the championship, I'd lost my friends, I'd lost my family. I think at a reaction to that, uh, instead of trying to help people, I was about 
showing people that I still was the champion. And I think that deception comes to people, men, uh, when we can't gra grab that, that gold all the time. Yeah. I've found since that day, there's a liar and he deceives us into believing that we're worth nothing. Yeah. And I had come to a place of not thinking that my wife or my children or my mom and dad or my family, even my fans appreciated me any longer. It seemed like I had probably stepped on so many toes because of the stardom that had happened to my life. I had stepped on too many toes that I felt like I was just had uh, lost everything. And I did go to the place of wanting to end my life and thinking that, what do I got to lose? What do I have to lose? I've already lost everything else, so. Dorsey was in a kickboxing match just about six weeks ago over in Paris, France, when he got the call saying he could have this fight. So, you know, let's go back and talk for a minute about the rich history that you came up in as far as boxing. I came to Dallas, Fort Worth, geez, I don't know, in, in the early 1980s. And your manager, Dave Gorman, had a gym over in Fort Worth, Texas. And Gene Hatcher, junior welterweight champion of the world, uh, Donald Cobra uh, Curry. Curry, uh, his brother Bruce Curry was part of that originally, and Rock and Robin Blake, uh, Stevie, little Stevie Cruz, Stevie Cruz, him. who was a world champion. Yes, sir. And then you're south of Fort Worth, down in Mansfield, Texas. What? 20 minutes? Yes, sir. And you decide you're going to go over there and start working out with those boxers, right? Because you were a kickboxer. Yeah, I want to be a better kickboxer. I want to be a better kickboxer. You want somebody to help you with your hand technique. Exactly, exactly. I, I wasn't really trying, at the, at the, in the beginning, I wasn't going there to be a boxer. I was going there to be a better kickboxer. And of course, it turned out uh, Steve Cruz won the world title, I think, in 86. And you were his chief sparring partner. I, for that. I, I was, uh, I got to be his sparring partner. I don't know if I was his chief sparring partner, but I was one of two. And uh, I was the Barry McGuigan. Yeah, he, he beat the, the Irish Barry McGuigan for the championship, yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, so you were the Barry McGuigan, and, uh, and, 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 but, but that, working with him, gave you the confidence that you could be a champion boxer as well, didn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, it helped me to see I was right there at ringside. I'll never forget when he won the world title, and I was just so, so happy to be a part of that team. And, uh, it helped uh, help me think, okay, I, I know I, if he can do this, not necessarily, I'm not putting Steve Cruz down at all, but I can do it too. Jerome, you were on arguably, now that my buddies over in Fort Worth will say differently, but arguably the best amateur boxing team in America at one time. Tell us a little bit about that team. Well, I, I was blessed enough in, in 1976, I graduated from high school two years to two months after graduation. Uh, Sheriff Faith Thomas was, was, was hosting a, a boxing crew, and he brought in a guy named Clinton Jackson. The who, captain of the 1976 who, Olympic who, team. Who was the captain of the, of the team, him and, him and Ray Leonard, they were yep. captain and co-captain. Mm. And, uh, and, and those guys, they were, they were amazing. I, I, was, I was just amazed at how talented they were, but, but uh, um, the sheriff, he had this team, and he, he let me come aboard, and, uh, and when I got started with them, I thought to myself, this is, this is amazing. I got to make this happen. So I won my first national title four months after joining the team. And, uh, and then, of course, four more after that. But I'm wow. telling you, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, Tell it was us who all was on the team. I had, I had stable mates, uh, Clint Jackson, Johnny Bumpus, uh, Mike McCallum. Uh, you had the Sorrell brothers, you had Donald Biles, you had them just... But who could fight? I mean, the local guys couldn't fight against any of those guys. No. They were too, you know, those were international caliber fighters. Yeah. We, we, were, we were traveling the world. Uh, it, was, it was the most amazing time uh, in amateur boxing back then because as soon as you won your first national title, the first thing they ask you is, do you have a passport? And certainly, I didn't even know what that was. So, <laughs> I came from the project. What is that? So, yeah. so, so, so sure enough, they got me a passport. And, and, uh, 
and 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 I got to see the world. So and so the most exciting part for me was that because I could box, they they allowed me to see the world, and all I had to do was ball my fists up and win. Jonathan Reed Dog Reed was a tremendous fighter. Well, I started doing martial arts when I was nine years old, and uh, I got my first degree black belt when I was uh, 18. I remember the very first amateur fight you had because we took a van load of kids up That's to right. Evansville, Indiana, and you yes, sang all the way up there. He was so good that he ended up as one of the stars on the NBC series, The Contender. Not only that, he fought William Joppy for the middleweight championship of the world. I was, uh, I was arrested for aggravated robbery. And the reason why they called it aggravated robbery is because I went into a, a Bonanza restaurant and held them up, told them to put the With money the in the bag. That's right. Yeah. I said, this is a robbery, don't make it no murder, put the money in the bag. Of course, the, the gun wasn't loaded, but who knows the gun is loaded or not if you can point the gun in somebody's face. And I put my hand on uh, one of the employee's shoulder who was in the office with the manager. And when I put my hand on, on the young lady's shoulder, that was the aggravated part. I aggravated her by touching her. And I was, you know, I, I had the manager at gunpoint telling them to put the money in the bag, so that's why they called it the aggravated robbery. Um, it's, you know, I wasn't on drugs or anything like that. It was just, I woke up one morning and was like, you know what, let's do it. I'm, I'm going up here to do it. And I, I went and robbed a Bonanza restaurant in Lebanon, Tennessee in uh, November of 1990. And they caught up with me in January. So. You did the crime and you had to do some time. That's right. Yeah. And so was it in prison then that you, uh, or while you were incarcerated, that you became a Muslim? Yes. And then when uh, I got incarcerated, I saw some of the Muslims in there that was in the Nation of Islam, and I would go to some of their services as well as go to some of the, uh, service, some of the Christian services. And uh, I was singing with two guys that was in the institution. You know, we were singing Christian songs. And one of the guys was saying, man, he said, brother, he said, you got a good voice, but we, we, you know, we've been talking about, you know, you, you sort of straddling the fence. So you, you, you're over here going to the Muslim services and you're over here going to the Christian services. It's like you're trying to find your way. Pointing out of the red corner from Nashville, Tennessee, Greg Anthony Cooper. When I was about 16 years old, you know, I started getting involved with gangs and stuff. I grew up around Peoria, Illinois. Um, started hanging out, you know, they said the wrong crowd, but I was just as much the wrong crowd as they were. Um, started, you know, running wild, drinking, getting into drugs and stuff. Uh, I moved here in 95. I was about 22 years old. Started doing good, getting my life together. You know, I started boxing, turned pro, but run in 96. Um, I had a bunch of fights during that time and Shortly after that, uh, after I got married, I had some friends of mine that got into selling drugs. And so uh, they were coming down making a lot of money and I was trying to make it in the boxing world. My wife was a musician at the time, you know, and, and so they had all this wads of money and so I was interested in getting that money myself. So I got involved with, uh, I used to drive out west, to pick up marijuana with these guys and uh, this went on for a long time and I was making a lot of money during this time. But, uh, my, my life was just falling apart. But you fought for the world championship yourself. And folks, I don't know if you know this, today a world championship fight is 12 rounds. Well, that's that's not the way they did it back in the day. Men fought men in those days, right. and it went 15, 15 rounds, right? Round. And, and right. so that from round 12 to round 15 was what we call the championship, championship. rounds. You better believe it. You got on an airplane and flew all the way to Australia overcame, you know, you had to get acclimatized and all of that stuff and yeah. in a short period of time and fought Jeff Finnick, who was a very rugged champion. Tell us about that experience. Well, you know, they, they sent me a video of Jeff and it was eight minutes long and it was every opponent that he had fought because he knocked them all out uh, before before eight minutes of 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 a, of, of a tape <laughs> ran out, and I so I, I didn't know if they were trying to get inside my head or what, but but sure enough, he was putting guys away left and right, and and uh, and so I started looking at him and watching some of the things that that he did, and 
and how he put guys away. And, and certainly I wasn't a guy that was going to be uh, accessible to, to standing in a corner and letting him, you know, just kind of. Yeah, you weren't going to let him hit you. No, no. no. If, if he hit me, he was going to get lucky. He's going to so, have to earn it. Yeah, you, know, you, you can bank on it. And so, sure enough, uh, the fight the fight went 15 rounds. And uh, and when the smoke settled, he was still standing and uh, he got the decision. Yeah. But w what was that like? Was that was that a great experience being there in Australia? And it was. Uh, Australia was one. Of, I had never been there as an amateur, so it was one of the first times that 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 I I got to be involved in in that whole uh, situation. And so, when I got there, uh, they were treating me very nicely, and and I didn't know how to take that because I knew that you know they couldn't have wanted me to win. So uh, the first people that I wanted to meet when I got to that country were the Aborigines. Yeah, I, you know, and they so they invited me to the to, to the uh, gym, and, uh, and and I spent some time with them, did some autograph signing and that sort of thing, and and uh, and and they they tried to uh, introduce me to their style of eating. I was getting ready for a fight, so I couldn't try anything new at the time, but but that that was a fun time for me. It was very educational, and uh, and then of course. Uh, the fight was a fight that I knew it was going to be tough. I, you know, Jeff had knocked everybody out before me, so I knew that. Again, he was, shows what a great boxer you were. Yeah, he was going. You know, I knew he was going to try to add me to that list, and and of course it was my job to not only not allow that, but to try to do it to him. And so, you know, he was uh, he was a tough fighter. He was he was uh, he was gallant. He was brave. He was he was a willing guy, and I was fighting him in his backyard. So. Yeah. It was going to be very difficult to get out of there with a the decision. Let me ask you this. Are you a man of faith? I am indeed. Yeah. I've had to talk to God between rounds. <laughs> you had to talk to God between rounds. He told me, get out of here. You don't go inside of my room no more. You know? And and I say, why? He said, I'm doing okay. Now I'm going to leave you. You know, I'm going to leave you. I got everything ready to go. Don't, it's five o'clock in the morning. I, mean, I just get out Sunday. I get out of Fridays and I come back Sunday. You've been gone oh, too, all weekend. Yeah, hang it out in clothes and clothes and with my friend and everything. Come from Vega, come from the Vegas, and I jump. I jump to New York, uh, 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 Atlantic City in the fight, and then from Atlantic City I went to the clubs. I don't went home the whole two days, and and. Been drinking, hung it out. When I went there, my I knocked the door. My boy say, "Oh, I don't gonna open the door. You're gonna sleep around the living room." Evander, this is the thing that I admired most about you more than anything. You were never ashamed of your faith. I can always remember you coming into the ring with, you know, Philippians 4:13 on your trunks. I'm very proud of it because you know, because. I knew that I came up poor. My mother, my mother only had a sixth grade education. My daddy didn't, didn't go to school. And so, you know, I'm the first one in the family that my mama made me realize that you're the first one in the family because you did what I asked you to do. The rest of them didn't do what she told them that you, you obeyed. Well, I, I, you know, you know, I did something. I I ain't do everything right. I did something, right? you know, cause you know you you fall short in the area. But my mother was my mother had a heart attack when I was a kid, so she was at home. So she got a chance to catch me and everything. You know why you get caught? I said, no, ma'am. She said, caught. It wasn't meant for you to do that. This is the reason why people get caught in things. It wasn't meant for them to do it, and so. So I stopped and then put all the time into to boxing. And I, and then once I start to see them, so I, I talk about God and I know that it was God helping me to be the person that I am. So, and I couldn't worry about what somebody else said because I know the truth. The truth is I couldn't be Cesar Collins if it weren't for that word of God. Amen. Evander, you've had a, an abundant life. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And so God's been good to you. And he's still good to me now. So let's go back and talk about you and Mike Tyson. You know, uh, 
you had had experience with Tyson and the amateurs. Well, you know, you know, you know, I was four years older than Mike Tyson, so you know, Mike Tyson, when he came, he was 17 and I was 21. And you know, so people ask me, why you never tell them about it? I said, who's gonna talk about it at 21 years old, boxing somebody who's 17, who's a kid? I said, you know, even though he was bigger, I said, but, but I said, but I was accustomed to sparring bigger guys and stuff like this. I said, so I was able to handle it. I said, so I said, it wasn't nothing to really say. You had worked with him when you were amateurs and you had gotten the best of him. And so when you, when they signed to fight you, you weren't worried about Mike Tyson. Well, well I, I just realized that we both in the same era and it's not like I wasn't trained. It's not like I rest or anything like this. I worked just as hard as he had. And then so it was, it was gonna be an interesting match, you know? I know that if he, he gets them good shots in, I may go down, but the fact of the matter, don't let him hit me. And that was the key. Everybody in the world thought Tyson was invincible in those days. And I thought from the get-go that you were gonna beat Mike Tyson. Personally, I thought, obviously, it's because you're a great, skillful fighter, but I thought the reason that you were able to beat him, nobody else had ever pushed him back, but you pushed him back and you made him fight. You didn't lay back, you didn't run from him. Well, you're right, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, you can't, you can't fight in defensively the whole time. Your, your, your fight got to be offense. Yeah, and then in the second fight, you know, I, I used to have a fighter that actually fought for two world titles. But when he would get in trouble, he would foul somebody. When Mike Tyson bit your ear, bit a piece of your ear off, you got frustrated, but you said later, you've made a lot of money for nine minutes. So explain how that all happened. Well, it when, when happened, you know, people, when people see they say, well, Mike bit his ear. And, but the thing is that in this fight, I was so frustrated. I was, the referee stopped the fight. Now, he bit me. Now, I want to get him back. But the Bible said, revenge is the Lord. So I questioned God right then and there. What is this all about? And he said, forgiveness. And he said, how long have you been fighting three rounds? Well, 12 years. He said, how much money do you get paid for? I said, well, nothing. That's when you was an amateur. Yeah, he said, yeah, he says, now this fight, how much money did you get? $35 million. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so what the devil meant to be a curse, God turned into a blessing. Well, of course, yeah, and, and that's it. So, you know, every time people talk about my ear, it, it allow me to remember that I forgave. Because I forgave, I'm free. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, Mike and I, we, we talk, we, we, we don't have any problems. But it's the fact of the matter, I just think that when people like, you know, Mike, Mike one, of the, uh, one of the most recognized athletes in the world. Yeah. And, you know, even Mike come back and say, oh, you know, I apologize. I forgive it. And, and this is what you have to do in life to succeed. So, Evander, you're saying that forgiveness is what helped you overcome that, even though that man did you wrong, when you forgave, that's what helped you overcome that. Well, I'm, I'm who I am, cause forgiveness, I know is the key to what love is really about. Amen. I'm saying, you know, God gave us for our sin. So he said, I forgave you, so you have to forgive. And I remember those next few months and couple of years that I was really concerned about you. And I would call you and check on you. How did you get through that experience? A lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, um, spend a lot of time with my family uh, and friends and, and, and just try to try to keep myself busy and, uh, you know, try, try to forgive the guy that did it. How do you think somebody else can overcome a tragedy like this in their life? What, what advice would you give to them? Keep God in their life, keep God in their heart, pray a lot stay with loved ones, um, and try to be forgiving. Well, take us back to that day and tell us what was going on and, 
and how you overcame that. The um, the day that that the um, the I was going to shoot myself was uh, just a normal day. I was just in so such a bad state of mind. I'd just come back from from being out of town partying, and I couldn't get the the feeling of love or the feeling of worth. You know the the high feeling of being somebody in the lights or in, in front of the uh, people or something. And I just co had come to a place that I decided to shoot myself. And I had got my 45 pistol and I walked out into the little room that's beside our laundry room. And I had decided that, you know, I didn't have nothing else to live for. And thank God um, I took the pistol and I had stuck it to my forehead, and as I was sitting there, I looked up into the room, and I seen on the shelf pictures of my family. And the thought come into my mind, and I know today because I know who I serve, God interjected the thought of my wife and family. And it was her birthday, matter of fact. And I decided I would just go wash her car. I remember thinking, I'll do, do something, something for, for her. her. Yeah since I'm going to do this and I know this is going to hurt her. So I didn't even have no mind of not changing anything. I was just going to go do something real fast for her and then show her I loved her and then do it. But while I was out there washing the car, there was a fight going on within my soul. I was trying to hurry to finish the car and I was knocking the skin off my fingers and I was just in turmoil. And I remember at a given moment, that I just had had enough. My body just quit and I fell down in the front yard. And I remember asking God, I know you're real. Will you please help me? Wow. And you know, it was like the heavens opened up and God reached in and he says, that's all I've been waiting on. Just waiting on you to turn to me. Anthony Brent Cooper was an amateur boxer when I first met him. He was a teenager when he got to town. He came to my gym, he sparred with a couple of my guys, and he looked like he really had some talent. And it wasn't long after that that he became a professional boxer. And he became good enough that he ended up on the NBC series called The Contender. Well, I just happened to be in the gym that day working out with a guy that was getting ready to fight. And so they came in, they, they, they filmed us, and they, they liked us, and they asked us to come down to Mississippi and audition for them. Sylvester Stallone was there. Sugar Ray Leonard was there. So he got to mingle with these guys, and he got the experience of fighting on that program. Went out to uh, California, filmed The Contender. Uh, there was like six or 7,000 fighters that auditioned for the show. They narrowed it down to 16. I was fortunate to make the show. And you are going to love what God has done in his life. My wife had really started seeking God and praying for me, and when she did that, you know, God really started working on my heart and started changing me, and I had an encounter where I really met Jesus. And what it, happened? I, uh, like I said, she'd been praying for me for a while, and, uh, as she, and when she did, I, uh, I, I, I would drive out west, and I was driving out there by myself, and uh, I decided I was gonna go on a fast. And I don't know if the people watching know what a fast is, but a fast is when you don't eat and you really seek God. I, I grew up going to church some as a kid, and I got saved when I was young, and, but I, I, was, I was in the world, I was out there. And so I, I decided I was gonna go on a fast and really seek God. And uh, the Bible says in John 4, 24, that God is the Spirit. I met the Spirit, and it also it says in 1 John 4, that God is love. I met the Spirit of love. And you would think I'm out there buying drugs, and I'm just running from, I'm just crazy. That it would just be such a judgment and such, you know, wrath. I never felt more joy and love and freedom and forgiveness in my whole entire life. And as I got out there to the people that I was buying the drugs from, I mean, I just could not shut up. I was like, I've met God. I've met, and I was just so free. And I mean, I'm in the middle of a big drug deal. There's such freedom and peace. And, and I got home to tell my wife and I was like, I met God, because I mean, she'd been praying for me and praying for me. And she thought I lost my mind.
You're going to sleep in the living room on the couch. And so you started listening to a radio program that morning. Yeah, yeah. Radio Vision Cristiana. It's funny, it's funny radio. Christian. And what happened? Well, I've been watching, I've been hit the, the, that man uh, talking, and he say, he been talking about the saints, you know, we talk about, and then he starts say, I heard, that I'm gonna say that somebody, he gonna help what I say. Uh, I'm talking only for one person, you know? And I mean, I mean like that, I mean, probably with that guy been talking something that, that he, that he talk about me. Touch your you know? heart. Yeah, he says, you think that you're, that you're gonna be forever the same, the same thing, you're gonna lose your wife, you're gonna lose your kid, you're gonna lose your, everybody gonna kill you outside, uh, and you better stop. You better start doing what you're doing, you know? And I, and I say, wow, he made it talking to me. And and they say, well, when I finish talking, when I finish preaching, I want these, these people to call me, because only one person is gonna call me. And right away he, he, he finished the, the preacher, I call it. You picked up the phone and called. I picked up the phone and I called and I called the man, and he told me it's a pastor, and he and he and he told me who is who is, who are you? I said I'm Benito, baby Roti, and I call you because you are talking to me. And they say no, I just talking to, I know I'm talking for somebody, but I know somebody gonna call me, and I don't know that you are gonna call, for you the man have been talking to. Him. I say yeah, you, everything that you say you just told me. You remember my life. You, you talk to me. I've been mean, losing my family. I've been mean, losing my, my everything. I and mean, that's what you're talking. That's what Jesus, no, I don't talk to you. Jesus talking to you. Come on, pick him up. The one thing I remember, and I've known you since you were eight years old, and um, the one thing I remember was you were always a good-hearted kid, even though in the ring, mm -hmm. you know, you you were certainly a man, and you were certainly a man to be feared when you started knocking everybody out. But there there was a time in your life when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, yes. right? Yes. Tell, tell, us, tell us about that. Uh, yeah, my, my pastor, Brother Johnny. Um, Johnny Minnick, the Johnny great Minnick. gospel singer, yeah. Yes, and that's my pastor, and uh, I was just going through a period of my life to where it just things went going right. Um, I, w I wasn't even boxing at this time. I was running a company and just with the money and just more anger and I just, nothing seemed to go right. And then one day my girlfriend at the time was like, hey, I want you to go to this church. We'll go to this church. And I went to the church and we all sat there and I, I you know, I, by this time I hadn't been in church in a while and I was sitting there and listening to Brother Johnny's one of his sermons and then he wanted he stopped in the middle of it. He says, I feel like there's someone here that I need to pray for. It. Someone that needs to let me pray for them and just come clear. And everything that he was saying spoke, it to, was, you. spoke to me 100%. I, I'm not an emotional guy. And as we prayed, I started crying with my hands over my face. And I've never felt that. I felt the Holy like, Spirit came yes, up. I yeah. felt free. And I was. I was the only one that raised my hand because I knew he was talking to me. And since that moment, I knew, you know, you have to live right. You, you, you have to live right by the Lord. You just, he is, you know, almighty. And I mean, and he can make mountains move for you. I mean, you just, you just have to give your heart to him. And you've always, I mean, I don't know where I would be if I did, if I wasn't in that moment at that church that time. And you were living the high life for a while. You got caught up in that. You're riding around in limousines. You're flying all over the world. Fame has a way of destroying our lives. Oh yes, sir. We're yes. getting sidetracked anyway. Yeah, one of the one of the characteristics that we should have is to be humble. And at times I'm humble, and there's at times, uh, like when I was with my wife just about a year or two ago, this guy came up and started talking to me, and he and he recognized who I was. So immediately my voice got stronger and got so much so filled with pride, it almost makes me cry because I just I just I just. I did it, and it just felt so bad that I that I did that. And so now, when uh, when someone says something to me, I always try to uh, 
try to just answer just like a regular person, because I'm just a regular old person, really. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinner, just saved by, by Jesus, saved by His grace and His mercy, and uh, I don't know what I would do without, without, without Him. And my, and my wife, again, so my parents got me started in the fighting business pretty much. And then my wife has spent many nights alone, uh, many weeks alone at time when I was traveling and, and fighting, and she just stayed with me the whole time. You know, when I was a young man, I didn't have to worry about somebody pulling a gun on me. I mean, I got in all kinds of street fights, and I don't know why, it seemed like I always attracted that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Back in our days, you know where everybody was by all the bicycles. All the bicycles at, at Tony's house, and that's where everybody was. And that, you know, what I mean, that's, that's nowadays you don't have that. What's the answer to you know? I mean, what advice could you give to these young men? You know, and and, and they're going to look up to you because of who you are and where you've been. What what advice could you give to these young men? I mean, you can't stop some of them from doing it, but there's somebody out there that would like to have a life like you've had. I mean, you're a business owner. You've got a, a successful business. You've been a world champion. What can somebody do to achieve their dream like you have? They gotta stay true to themselves, man, and, and believe in God and just trust in Him. And, and stay away from the negativity. You know, it's so important. It's, it's, for me, it's easy to say because I had that structured uh, uh, background, you know what I mean? The first thing I did in the morning, it, it was when I got up, was make my bed. If I accomplished nothing else that day, I come back home, my bed's made. I still, that, I still do that to this day, but it's just something that's instilled in me. We were talking a few weeks ago when we were here. We we're talking about all these young African-American men that don't have any opportunity in the inner city. And, you know, here, you know, you grew up in a military family, had a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. And so you grew up in a very structured lifestyle mm -hmm. and you were able to make it. What yeah. about that young man that's watching now and, and he can emulate with you he said, hey man, this guy's a, you know, a world champion kickboxer, owns a business, and I want to be like him. What would you tell that young man that he needs to do to become you know, more like you as a role model? Uh, stay true to yourself, stay true to God, and stay true to your dreams. And, and never let anyone deter you from your dreams. And you're a man of faith. You believe in, in the Lord and, and you know, follow Jesus. And, and so, has that helped you at all in your oh, life? Oh yeah, uh, I got, I fought, um, um, I get emotional. I get emotional, some of the kids. Yeah. They're coming here. From bad circumstances? Yeah. See now, now friends, you know, if you're watching out there, and you think you're Billy really Bad or something, and that, you know, big boys don't cry. Here's a man that was a three-time world champion kickboxer, and he has a heart of compassion for young men in bad circumstances like you. And what do you want to do to help those kids, Bernard? I just, I just you know, <clears throat> I wish they would just, you know, quit killing each other, you know what I mean? Well, the, the, the thing that brought me out of, uh, out of Islam and brought me back into Christianity was the way that I was feeling. You know, I was out with my, my father one day, and when we got back home, my father said, son, he said, I don't know what it is, but just, it's something not right about you. I don't, he said, I don't know what it is, but he said, is everything all right? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, I don't know what it is, but something's just not right with you. And uh, I wasn't... The longer the short is, I, I, I felt like I wasn't being spiritually fed. You know how you just, you, you, can, you, you can feel the spirit yeah. when, you, when, you, when you're in the Word. I, I just, I didn't feel like I was being spiritually fed. And Islam had me, I, I felt like I was, uh, I, I had like a hate spirit in me. Yes. You know, you I, would, I, would, I would hate this person because, uh, because it wasn't, of the color It wasn't a religion of love. That's right. I was like, what in the world? I said, this ain't right. And you know, I'd be calling people out of their name. Didn't even know them from Adam. Well, I'm like, what, what is going on? I, I did that one day. I was in the parking lot of a Kroger's uh, grocery store. And uh, I was like, what the? I said, now why am I talking about that person? I don't, I don't know that person. You don't know their heart. I don't know their heart. And I said, this, this has got to stop. So uh, I got out of it. 
and uh, I started going back to uh, the Christian church and I, I felt like I was at home. So you rededicated your life to Jesus Christ. That's right. And I understand that recently you've been ordained to preach. Yes, sir. I've been going through uh, MIT, which is called, it's Ministers in Training at my church. It's a New Covenant Missionary Baptist Church in, in Nashville. And uh, we've been going through that for a couple of months. And just on the uh, 4th of May, 4th of this month, I did my first sermon at the church. And, you know, after, after we do our first sermon under the uh, uh, Baptist doctrine, we can go ahead and uh, you get a license. So I, I do have a license to preach. And uh, I feel pretty good. Well, all right. Mm -hmm. You know, e even one of the great fighters, Evander Holyfield, often talked about in his boxing career, you know, that he served the true and living God, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Is that right. the way you feel today? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do. You know, I do serve a true and living God. Yeah. You know, God is uh, God is almighty. And, and the thing that I always recognized about these other religions is that Mohammed is in the grave, Buddha is in the grave, but when you go to Jerusalem, the tomb is empty mm -hmm. That's because right. we serve a living Savior That's right. who died, was buried, and rose again. On the third day, that's right. And so it's by His sacrificial death that we're saved. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, folks, here you are listening to Jonathan Reed, a former professional boxer not only a professional boxer, but a man who fought for the world championship. I'm talking about the championship of the whole world. And he was in Islam and he said, I felt like, you said, I felt like I was in a religion of hate. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Christianity where Jesus taught us to love one another. That's right. Like I said, we were talking about the love of God. This is, this is the key. You know, Jesus said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. This is the key that unlocked the insecurities that I had, the, the hopelessness, you know, the emptiness that I'd had. You know, everybody's got the wounds, the scars that they grew up with. You know, they didn't get this, they didn't get that. And I think that everybody's made with a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. Right. It says in Ecclesiastes that He's placed eternity in our hearts. That goes on forever. And only He can fill it. And so I would encourage them to get into God's Word and take all the scriptures about the love of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved me that he gave Jesus. 1 John 4, uh, 18, perfected love cast out fear. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Um, you know, Romans 5, 5, God's love is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. To meditate on those, renew your mind to that love of God, and that will help you to get that revelation of God's love for you, and it will come real to you. And yeah. then you don't have to try to fit in with everybody. Hey Amen, that's good stuff. Keith McKnight once said to me in a private conversation, you know, we're, we're from the South, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, there has been some racism in the South right, before. Right. And Keith once said to me, after we'd been in boxing, after he'd been in professional boxing for 10 or 15 years, he said, you know, Kerry, you can't be a racist and be in professional boxing. And what he meant by that was that we had met so many people mm -hmm. together would travel, would slept in the same room, eating at the same table of people with all different races. Mm -hmm. right. And so we love people regardless of their race, creed, or color. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what Jesus Christ taught. Jesus Christ said, by this will they know that you are my disciples mm -hmm. if you have love one for another. That's right. Well, I'd just like to say that uh, God is good all the time and all the time God is good and if you ever feel like that you you know want to give up on your dreams give up on life always look to the Lord because he is the one that will get you through you know Gene there's so many people out there watching this program today and men that are struggling with issues in their life how would you encourage them as a former champion who contemplated suicide but overcame that and is totally dedicated to Christ today, how would you encourage them to walk by faith in Jesus Christ today? I would say to all men, whether they're in church or not, that God created us for a reason. He created us to be the leadership of the, of the household. And I know that today that that is 
more harder, more so than it has ever been before because of the divorce rate and the different financial things that have happened in our economy. But I can say that as men, God has created us for that reason. And in walking in the light of Christ, there is more security, more power, more courage, more love than in any other phase of my life, whether it was champion of the world, whether it was riding in a limousine, whether it's in the lights, in the cameras, at the pr press box, there has never been a better feeling of contentment and of consistent compassion and love as it, with Christ as there has been today. Maybe somebody's beat you up, maybe somebody's robbed you, maybe somebody's divorced you, and if you haven't gotten over it, it's because you haven't learned, like Evander, to forgive. The most important thing, that it, that's what I like to tell people, and I think that each generation is supposed to come back and, and tell the young people out there the same thing, that God is real, and that, you know, you trust in Him, everything will be all right. I can't tell you what an honor it's been to have you on in your corner. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. I was involved in uh, drugs, promiscuity, alcohol, all of that stuff just like many of you have been for many years. But I wouldn't trade my life with Jesus Christ for all of the world's wealth. Friend, I want you to know that our God loves you.